What a great song for the, the sermon that we're about to have here in a minute. And uh, fits so well together, and I'm thankful the Lord does that. And uh, it's helpful for me. Um, you would not understand this if you're not, if you're not uh, a, a pastor or, or you preach regularly, but you sometimes have many things on your mind that you want to preach and, or that you feel God is leading towards. And then, um, and then as you're getting ready, uh, you're turning to Philippians chapter 4, by the way, but as you're getting ready, you're wondering, is this the thing for this morning? Um, I, you know, this will sound odd to you, but it's just me being transparent. Is um, I would love to get to preach to you uh, for the next five hours, just to, get to tell you everything that I could think that would help your life out of the Bible. Um, I, my, my heart is I want to see you succeed. And I want to see you make it. And I want to see your families make it. And I, and I know things that go on in people's lives. And I just want to tell you, well, this would help. And, th- and this thing would help. And it's almost like a, a mechanic that, would, that, would, uh, that knows all the problems on the car and doesn't just want to fix just the radiator, but he wants to fix this too. And, and I noticed that the lug nuts were off and I can help with that. And, and, you, and you just want to give so many different things to help. The problem that I have is I get, for some of you, I get one shot a week at trying to help you completely revolutionize your life and get it on track with God. Get one shot. And for some of you, I get about 30 minutes of that. After about 30 minutes, you're checked out. You're thinking McDonald's or Arby's or whatever down the road. And so I get about 30 minutes a week to just try to give you as much God as I can. And then my heart is, I wish you'd come back Sunday night because I'd love to give you a little more that I could help you with your life. And not that you need me. What you really need is you need this book. And you, need, and you need the Holy Spirit of God. That's what you really need. But my heart is, as a teacher of the Word of God, as I feel God's gift to me to teach, is to try to take the truths of this book and unfold them to you so that you can have some help for your life. I'll tell you, one of the worst things about being a pastor is watching people continuously crash the ships of their, the boats of their life on the rocks and just messing their lives up and, and being in one minute and being out the next and the, the winds of life just blowing them every different direction. You just want to see people make it. You want to see lives salvaged. You want to see marriages do well. You want to see kids raised in homes that love the Lord. You want to see strength. And, uh, and so you get all these thoughts in your mind. What could help? What could help? I could pull this wrench out or I could grab this hammer or I could... And then you get a song like that wherever you all went to and it makes you feel like all right, you're on the right track. And, um, and this, is the, this is the wrench for this situation right now. And, uh, and hopefully that'll be a help to you. Philippians chapter 4 <clears throat> is probably the last message I'll do out of Philippians now. Philippians chapter 4. If you've got a Bible, open it up. Um, read it. If you've got an app on your phone, do it. Um, but read through the Bible with me. Uh, again, this is, church is not a, an entertainment of 30 minutes. It really isn't. It isn't come and watch a guy and... Was he entertaining? Was he funny? It, it's all about this. And it's all about you getting this in your life. And um, so, so grab something, get a hold of the, the Word of God. Philippians chapter 4, and then look at verse number 10. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me, the church of Philippi, Paul's in prison. Remember, he's written this. And they have sent a man named Epaphroditus to help him and bring a gift and probably financial support. Uh, but last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye also uh, you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want. He said, I'm <clears throat> not speaking this because I want something for you. He says, for I have learned. I want you to get these phrases. These are key phrases. I have learned something. here. I've learned. And whatsoever state I am, that doesn't mean Texas or Georgia or California, not the state, but what, like the state of mind. I, I'm in a state of confusion. I'm in a state of anxiety. I'm in, I'm in a state of depression. I'm in a state of despair. Whatever state I'm in, therewith to be content. He says, I've learned, and now in verse number 12, I know. I've learned, and then I, I know something. I know both how to be abased down. I know how to abound. I know how to deal with when, I'm, when, I'm, when things are low. I know how to deal with it. I know how to deal when things are, are up. He says this, everywhere and in all things, I'm instructed, so I've learned, I know, I'm instructed, both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. 
I think it's interesting the phrases here. He says, I've learned, I know, I'm instructed, and now I can do. Verse 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. <clears throat> now that's a verse people have, uh, you know, inscribed on their refrigerator, you know, on their mirror, on their car. You know, they have, I can do all things through Christ strengthens me. Uh, most people, and I'm going to mention at the very end of, this, of the deal, they have no clue what the context of that verse really is. The context of that verse is, I can be content in whatever lot I am in in life. He said, I don't think I can do it. I can do all things through Christ with strength to me. I can be content. Hey, but things aren't going very well. I feel very low. I can still do it through Christ. Things are going, things are going really great right now. And I feel like I'm up on a mountain. Then I feel like I'm low. Then I feel like I'm high. Then I feel like I'm low. And a lot of us will give up along the journey because everything's not just mountaintops. And you say, I don't know if I can do this. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. It doesn't mean I can be an NBA player next week because I can quote that verse every single hour until next week and I'm still not going to dunk a basketball. Let me say amen to that. I still ain't doing it. It doesn't mean I can do all, I can do all things. No, it's talking about in the context is I can make it through some of the difficulties of this life. Jacob, I didn't mean to upset you about the NBA thing. Did I? I didn't mess you up. All right, okay. All right. <clears throat> all right, good. Just making sure it didn't already mess you up at the very, very beginning. He's, his hopes and dreams has been an NBA star all this time, and I just ruined it. Um, but that's what he's saying here. That's what he's talking about. I've learned. I know. I'm instructed, and therefore, I can do. I can do. Uh, what, what is Paul saying here? What is contentment? Contentment is being satisfied, having a mind of peace, not disturbed. That's what contentment is. He says, I've learned what sort of a state I'm there with to be content. It would be something like saying this, feeling complete with joy and peace. None of us feel that way a lot of times. Feeling complete. I feel like I don't need anything. I'm complete. I have joy and I have peace. I'm not disturbed in the circumstances that I'm in while I continue to work and excel in the things that God has called me to do. The life that I'm living with Christ. On the contrary, we are a very discontented people. For the most, how many of you say amen to that? You may say, I can't say amen to anything you've said so far. How many of you can say amen to this? We are fairly discontented people. Let me say amen to that. We are. We are. We complain about our children being too noisy instead of being thankful at least they're happy and healthy. We complain about our home when there's thousands of people that have no homes at all. We complain about and gripe about work when there's people that would just, they're just begging for any kind of job. We're discontented people. And Paul's saying in this, listen, situations won't dictate how content I am and where my joy is at. That's why he says, uh, and, and everywhere and in all things. It's, it, situations won't dictate. Remember where he's at when he writes this? He's in prison when he writes. Hey, I, I, where are you at, Paul, while you're talking about being content and talking about being joyful? Oh, I'm in prison. Wait a minute, you, you're content, listen now real close, this. you're content, you're, you're happy with being in prison? No, I don't think Paul was happy in being in prison. In fact, he was even saying, I desire to be with you. I don't think he was happy to be in prison, but he was satisfied in being where God wanted him to be at that moment. He was satisfied with God. Things are not always going to be great, but I can tell you something, you can still find joy and contentment even when things are not great in life. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. Situations that he faced everywhere and in everything. Substance would not dictate. He says, I know how to be full and I know how to be hungry. He says, there's times that I've got everything I need and there's times that I don't have everything I need. Situations, substance. And then in this, he talks about in verse number 15, he said, Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me concerning giving and receiving, but ye only, meaning this, there, he could not even depend on someone to meet his needs. There were times that he did not have things that people could have helped him with, and they just didn't help him. Can I tell you something? Listen, your contentment, your joy, your peace cannot be dictated by the situations of life, the substance you have, or even someone around you. Why? Why, why do you say that? Because those things can change and those things can fail you. How many of you have ever been let down by a person before? Your contentment, your joy, and your peace 
cannot be always attached to those things. And so Paul said some things here. I want you to get it. He says, I, have, I, I wrote them down. I, I, I marked them. I highlighted them. I drew lines to them. I have learned. I know. I am instructed. And therefore, I can do. What was it that Paul uh, learned? What was it that Paul says, now I know? What was it that Paul said, when I'm going through the ups and downs, something is instructing me? What was it that he was instructed that he knew, that he learned, that maybe we can learn something from to help us with our contentment? Number one, if you're making notes with this, he learned to seek God. Listen real close to these things. There's only three little points here. He learned to seek God more than his possessions, his pleasures, or his positions in life. He learned to seek God more than possessions, pleasures, or position in life. In other words, this, he was chasing God and not chasing things. The problem is we spend more time chasing things than we do chasing God. And because of that, we, when we don't grasp the thing that we think we want, we feel very discontented in life. When really all we really need is God. Now, four or five of you agree with that. I, 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 when I was in uh, New York, uh, actually I did it in Colorado and I did it in New York. I was asked to do it in, in Colorado and then I did it in New York and I, and I got some good feedback from it. But you remember the lady that was in uh, John chapter number 4, the woman at the well? Remember that story about that? Well, that woman that was at the well, when she was going there every day to, to go and, and draw water there at the well, and that became her practice, and every day she would go and do the exact same thing. And Jesus showed up one day and said, it's really not about this well, it's not about this practice that you're doing. You can have something a whole lot deeper than what you do every day. You can have a relationship with me. That's what he's saying to her. And then later on, he talks to her about her husband. He says, uh, go get your husband. <coughs> and I taught on this, and I said this, I don't think he was trying to slap her in the face and say, yeah, you're right, you don't have, you've had five husbands, you're, a, you're a, a worthless one. I don't think he was doing that. He was saying, you keep looking for somebody to satisfy you. And Jesus is what you need to satisfy you. And then he starts telling her, he says, they start talking about worship. She said, well, we worship in this place. This is the place where we worship. And he said, the time comes and now is when every man will have to worship in spirit and in truth. It won't be about a place or a location or a denomination. It'll be about a relationship that's inward. There's, there's got to be something deeper. And so what Paul is saying here is, it's not about me trying to, to get things or this thing or that thing, or even a position. Somebody says, well, if I ever just get to the place that I can be the pastor, then I'll be content. I'm telling you, you won't be. If I can ever just get to the place that I'm the, I get promoted up to this certain level, then I'll be content. I promise you, you won't be. It won't be about a position. It won't be about your true contentment will be found in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. Look back at, at chapter number 3 with me very quickly. <clears throat> and watch what Paul says. Look at chapter 3. I want you to just watch the wording. Because everything we're talking about here is found kind of in Philippians. You can see where his contentment came from. Look at chapter 3 and look at verse number 10. <clears throat> chapter 3, verse number 10. He says, this is what Paul says, I just want to know Him, that I may know Him. I want to know Him, chapter 3, verse number 10, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. I want to know what it's like to live a resurrection life. Not meaning I want to die and then be resurrected. I want to know what it's like to live a life with the resurrection power. The Holy Spirit of God is living in me. And I am able to have a true and genuine walk with Jesus Christ. Listen to me now. Most people have no clue what I'm talking about right now. Most people's Christianity, and I'm not trying to beat you up, but I, I want you to understand something. Most people's Christianity is the depth of their Christianity is the fact that they go to a local church on occasion. That's the depth of their Christianity. Now, and let me tell you something. I'm glad you're here. I praise God that you're here. But I'm just telling you, Paul said, I'm not content with just a religion. I want a relationship. I want to know Him. I've, he says, I've learned. I've learned something. The only way you're going to learn something is spending time with someone. That's it. Um, 
I'm going to pick on you, but Brother Andrew is back there. Visited the church the other day, and then he came to visitation. Praise God for doing that. And, and I thought, you know what? I would normally go to his house and do a follow-up and say hello, but here he is here. I don't have to go to his house. He came to our house. And so I thought, well, let's just ride around. You know what I did? I've known him by name. I spent about an hour and a half with him getting to know him at a deeper level. You know what a lot of people do? They spend a little bit of time just knowing Jesus by name. But I'm asking you to spend some time getting to know Jesus Christ in your life. Getting to know about Him. Getting to understand how He works and what He wants in your life. And walking with Him and talking with Him and reading His Word and spending time in prayer and getting to know Him. I want to know the resurrection power. I want to know what it's like to walk in the Spirit. Most people think walking in the Spirit means that I'm loud or I get excited. Well, that guy's Spirit-filled. Spirit-filled has nothing to do with the volume of your voice. Being able to sense the Spirit of God in your life directing your life in conjunction with the Word of God, for some people, that, that's oblivious to them. They, they think that sounds mystical. Paul says, I have learned to walk with Him. I've learned to be instructed in whatever lot of my life how to walk with Him. He says, I want to know Him, is what he says in verse number 10, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings be made conformable unto His death. Watch what he says. If by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead, I want to, I want to have that resurrection power. Verse number 12, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. Now if Paul could say, I'm not yet perfect, then so could we. But here's what he says I am going to do. Listen real close. I follow after. If that may, I may apprehend that for which I also am apprehended to Christ. Meaning this, apprehension means I grab you, Brother Mike, and I put you in handcuffs. I apprehended you, right? You know what he says? I have been apprehended. I've been caught by Christ. He's got me. He's got me. How many of you have he got you? But you know what he says? I want more of him. I want him. He's got me. I want more of him. I just want to know Him. How many of you are hungry to just know Jesus Christ? Are you as hungry to know Jesus Christ as you are hungry to have more money in the bank account or to have a bigger screen TV or have a nicer car or a nicer house? I'm just saying to you, how is our contentment with Jesus? I want to know Him. I want to know Him. He says, I follow after that may apprehend. In verse number 13, brethren, I count not myself app- app- apprehended, but this one thing I do. Listen, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth in those things which are before, I press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He said, I just want to press towards Him to know more of Him. So I was begging you to do more of, hey, come to church, get involved in Bible studies, read your Bible. Bring your Bible to church. Get in your Bible. This is not about a church group. This is not about a denomination. This is about a relationship. So you can become content when you start just trying to spend more time with Christ. I want you to hold a place right there and look at 1 Timothy chapter 6 very quickly with me. 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy 6. Just talking about contentment and knowing Him. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Look at verse number 6. <clears throat> Paul's talking uh, as an older man to a younger preacher, a younger uh, Christian. Watch what he says. But godliness, that's being more like God. Godliness with contentment is what? Say it. Great gain. Great gain. If we brought nothing in this world, then it is certain we can carry nothing out. I don't care how, how tightly you pack it. You ain't getting it out of here. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall in temptation and a snare into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all uh, evil, which while some covet after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Look at verse number 17. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. 
let me help you, help you understand something. Does that mean that rich people are bad? You answer that for me. Does that mean rich people are bad? No. It doesn't mean that at all. But it means that if you're, if you're only trusting in your riches, you're trusting in something that can fade away that quick. I know people right now that have wealth. You know what they do? They trust in God. They, they give to God and they work with, with God. And, and so it has nothing to do with if I am rich, but it is this. Do I love God? Do I want more of God? Or do I, do I need more money? Your contentment will be coming and going if it's all about substance and it's not about Jesus Christ. Contentment. We live in a world today where we have tied ourselves, listen real close, we have tied ourselves to things rather than Christ. Society, our TVs, tell us that we need more things than we actually need. We're being tacked constantly with ads. You need a new car. You need a new truck. You need a workout machine. You need a new phone, a better phone. You need this tool. You need a particular makeup, and it'll make you look so much better. You need a particular pill or a, a particular medication, and then afterwards they say, this pill will cure a cough, but it may cause you to lose a limb later on down the road, something like that. You need something. You need this, and you need that. We live in a society that's like that. We we, we become so dissatisfied with things. We become dissatisfied with clothes. We buy more. We become dissatisfied with a wow, our, our spouse. So we have to get rid of this one to get another one. We become dissatisfied with our life. So we think the best way to fix our life is to move geographically across the world because that will fix my life. I promise you, the problems you have here, you move to the other side of the world, those same exact problems that are in here will also find their way there. What are we saying? It's got to be something deeper than our substance. <clears throat> there was a man one time who had a friend who bought a nicer house than he bought. And he said, uh, can't have that. i got to get a nicer house. And so uh, he put his house on the market and told his wife, said, you run the ad for the house. I'll spend time looking for a new one. And so he started running through all these ads, looking for it, and pretty soon... He contacted the real estate agent and said, I have found the perfect house. I've saw the ad. I know this is exactly what I want. Described it to her. And she said, sir, that's the house you're selling. <clears throat> Sometimes we need to learn to just be content with what we currently have. In, the, in, the, the, in Philippians there, <coughs> Paul said, I just want to know him. I just want to know him. Number two is this. Number one was he learned to seek God more than possessions and pleasures and positions. Number two is this. He learned to be satisfied with God's providence, that God is in control and God's taking care of things in his life. He began to be, he, he, be, he found himself learning, being instructed and knowing, and so therefore he could do what he was supposed to do because he trusted God. Look at Philippians chapter number 1. I want you to see this very quickly. Just looking through what, what takes place here in Philippians. Philippians chapter 1. Look at verse number 5. He trusted God. He said, For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You know what he was saying there? To them, he said that you and I are, are partakers. We're in fellowship when it comes to the gospel. Let me tell you something. You know what you can trust Jesus Christ with? You can trust God with? The fact that He has made every provision necessary to save your soul, to take care of your sin, and give you eternal life. He's done that. How, let me ask you a question. How many of you are saved this morning? Do you believe that? I heard a preacher say one time, he was... He was uh, been preaching for years, and I know him well. He's been preaching for years, and one day he started having he started having a lot of sickness, and he kept having a sickness and a sickness and a sickness, and uh, and one of the guys from his church was a was a doctor and said, "I want you to come in and see me. You get sick a lot, and I need you to come and see me." Came and saw him, and uh, it was did some blood work, and it was a week later, a few days later, him and his wife were driving on the road, and the doctor called him and said, "I need you to come to my office." I need to speak to you. I need to talk to you. And he said, what is it about? He says, it's about the blood work. And he said, um, just tell me. He said, no, I'm not going to tell you. You're driving on the road. I'm not telling you. I need you to come to my office. He goes, no, tell me right now. 
He said, I can't tell you right now, but I need you to come to my office. And he said, I'm not coming unless you tell me right this second. He says, you have cancer. So he started making his way towards the doctor's office. And his, this is what he said. <coughs> he said, the whole way there. You may have ever driven somewhere, and when you got there, you're, you're thinking, I wonder how I, I, I don't remember ever stopping at a stop sign or a stoplight. Maybe I didn't. I don't, you, ever, you ever done that? You're, you're thinking about something else? He said, the entire way there, he never thought about what he was doing when he was driving. The only thing he thought about was this. I have believed in Jesus Christ. And I have told people what salvation is. Now I am faced with the reality of trusting in it all the way to the end. For some of us, we say, Amen, I know I'm saved. But do you really trust Jesus Christ as your Savior? You put your faith and trust in Christ. Paul says, we have trusted the gospel. We are fellowship in his gospel. And he's, he's, what he started in us, listen, what he has started in us, he will finish. Hebrews says he is the author and the finisher of our faith. How many of you trust Jesus Christ with our salvation? How about trust him with your life? He talks about that in here that he's, I've, I've trusted him with, with saving me. I'm trusting, I'm confident that he will finish what he has started in us. In verse number 19 of chapter 1, he says, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation. He's in prison. He's not sure if they're going to kill him, take his life. He says, it's going to turn to my salvation through your prayer. Salvation not in the sense of I'm, I'm going to get saved. Salvation in the sense of deliverance from this prison. He says, and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. In verse number 23, he says, I'm in a strait between two, having a desire to be part and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh with you is more needful for you. I want you to understand what Paul's saying in this, and just follow with me. Paul is saying in here, I'm satisfied that while I do not know what the circumstances of this situation will be, I'm satisfied that God knows. Well, I don't know if I'm going to, if, if one of these days, while I'm in this prison, I'm going to hear them marching down the hall, sharpening their sword, come in and take my head off. I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to, if tomorrow I'm going to be absent from this body and be present with the Lord, or if tomorrow they're going to come down and say, Paul, you've been released. Go back and visit all your friends. He says, I don't know how any of this is going to work out, but I do trust God. That's what he's saying. Can you trust God with your life? In chapter 4, listen to what he says. Chapter 4, this is things you know. We've, we've talked about it. I think Pastor Bishop did something on it. In chapter 4, and verse number 6, be careful for how many things? Be careful for, say it, nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Let me tell you something. Number one, he wanted to know Christ. He wanted more of God. Not possessions. I want more of Jesus Christ. But number two, he says, I'm satisfied with trusting that God knows what he's doing in every situation I'm going through. And when I find myself in a situation that's difficult, how many of you found yourself in a situation like that recently? How many of you, the first thing you did, let me tell you what I do. First thing I'll do sometimes is grab the phone and go to Google. Have you ever done that before? I mean, the first thing you do is you get on your knees and start talking to God. Not be full of care, but pray. And thank God for what He's already doing. And ask Him for the supplication, the supply. And then let the peace of God that passes all understanding keep you. We know that verse is there. I told you that the other day. I told you that when we were trying to figure out about having a child, I said this on Wednesday, and uh, we were doing all the paperwork for adoption. <coughs> and then uh, we called them up and said, hey, we've done all this money. We've done all the fingerprints. We've done all the, the background checks and all this stuff. And we've spent everything and all the time invested. And we're waiting on uh, you to give us some results on, on adoption. And then they said, we lost all your paperwork. We need you to go away and start everything over again. 
and, uh, and we, we lost your phone or we've lost everything. Just go away and come back maybe in a year. And I remember I was so heavy hearted. I thought, this is terrible. What in the world is God doing? What in the world is this, is this company doing? And I, I had to preach that night. I was on a Wednesday night. And I remember walking with Stacy and saying, this is not fair. I don't, I don't understand this. I don't like this. And I was going to have to preach that night out of Philippians chapter 4 in that verse. And Stacy said to me as you're walking, this, normally I'm trying to encourage her, but she was encouraging me. And she said, you're going to have to believe what you're preaching. In situations of life, you say, I don't really like the situation. I mean, I don't either. But I can be content. You say, how do you can be content? I can be content in God. That I can trust that He knows what is happening. And He can take care of it. And I can cast my care on Him because He what He cares for you. I can do that. I can tell you that through personal testimony, <clears throat> when we went to Thailand, talking about being a ba- He said, "I've learned to be a base, to be a bound. I've learned that when I go through things, He said that people came and helped Him and took care of Him. That's what He said took place in this." I can tell you that in personal experience, when we went to Thailand, we told, uh, we told the church that we're going to go to Thailand. We're going to sell everything we own. We lived in Kempner. <coughs> we told everybody, said, have you ever been to our house and you saw something that you liked in our house? Come by tomorrow and buy it. We're selling everything we own. We're going to take all the money. We're going to take it to Thailand and give it to the mission there. And, um, and we're going to live there, probably live the rest of our lives in Thailand. That's what we thought. We ended up staying there for one year. We sold everything we had. We gave our vehicle away to a family in Georgia. And, um, and then we, we left with the Thailand. When we got there, everything we had in life boiled down to about $12,000. And we gave all of that immediately when we got there. We gave it towards them renovating a building they could start meeting in in church. And then every bit of the monthly support we got, we would use it to pay for what we were doing. Uh, and then we gave the rest of the money to the mission group that we were with for them to use. We didn't have any money saved. We didn't have any furniture. We didn't have anything saved anywhere. We had the clothes on our back. We went there. Everything we owned in life was given to that, that, that work. After about a year, it wasn't even a whole year, it didn't work out with what we were doing. And we had to come back. And when we came back, because it didn't work there, we came back. We would have thought, what are we going to do? Now we have zero dollars, zero cents, zero anything except for clothes that we're wearing. And, uh, and so we're trying to figure out what to do in life. I, I can tell you that I have learned, I have learned that I can trust God in whatever goes on in my life. I've learned that. You say, how'd you, can you tell me the secret how you learned that? I learned it by just continuously walking with Him. And He has taken care of me. He has taken care of my wife. You can trust God to take care of you. You can trust Him to save your soul. You can trust Him to get you all the way to the very end of this. And you can trust Him with everything of your daily life. You can trust Him. We have more now with our life, if you were to count it up in substance, than we had before we ever left to go to Thailand. God has taken care of us. As we walk with Him, this is what Paul's saying, as I've walked with Him, He has met every one of my needs. Listen, folks, some of you are going to get out and you're going to stop walking with God and you're going to quit on this whole thing because God, you felt like God failed you in something you went through. I'm telling you, God has not failed you. God knows what He's doing. You just keep walking with Him. He will take care of everything along the journey. We were trying to have a child. I had brought this up to Stacy yesterday. We were thinking, 20 years of waiting. God, what are you doing? And we were going through the ups and downs of all of that stuff. You know what we had to learn to do? We had to be content to just wait on God's timing. You know what else we had to do? Listen to this. Some of you are going through this now. We had to learn to be content with each other. While we were waiting on God to do something in our life, we had to learn to be content with each other. Stacy had to learn to just, we just walked with God and trusted God. She would work a job and we started just learning to be content with what God gave us in our life while we were waiting on what God was going to give us. Now listen, I've said this before several times. If I would have quit, we would have missed out on what we were praying for. You just keep 
Contentment is not, well, I love this. I love this not being, uh, not having any money thing. I love this not having a car or a home. I just re- so love this not having a child thing. Contentment is not loving the situation. Contentment is trusting God in the situation. You learn to be satisfied with God's providence. And lastly is this one. He was steady and he was, in, he was sure of God's purpose. He was steady and he was sure of God's purpose. Look back at Philippians chapter 1. Look very quickly. It's the last little point. <clears throat> he said, I, I just want to seek God and I want more of Him than I do possessions. I'm satisfied with His providence. He can take care of all things. And then I'm steady in my walk in His purpose, God's purpose. In, in uh, chapter 1, look at verse number 12. He says, But I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened to me have fallen out rather for the furtherance of the gospel. I want you to understand, there's no way you're going to get through this life and not have difficulties. I want you to understand that. We live in a fallen world. There's no way we're getting through this life and not face some difficulties. Some of you are, are spouses married to unbelievers. And you got saved, and now you're asking God, you're begging God for that person to finally get saved. And there's, there's irritation in that where you're wanting to follow God and you're wanting to be around God and this person doesn't want to. And that's, 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 that's hard, that's, that's irritable, that, that it doesn't always work out exactly the way you're thinking. And I'm telling you, that is a difficult thing of this life. God has told us that some of those things will be difficult. Let me tell you something else. We live in a free country. And I praise God for a free country we live in. But I'm going to tell you something. We live in a world that's filled with some pretty disgusting things. We live in a world that's filled with some pretty bad people. You say, I don't, maybe four or five of you believe that. The rest of you, turn on the news for five minutes. Don't watch more than five minutes of it, but turn on the news for five minutes. You can see this is a messed up world we live in. He told them... In chapter number 12, he said, all I'm trying, I'm in chapter 1 and verse 12, I'm trying to live for God and people hate me for it. They've put Paul in prison simply because he loved Jesus Christ. And then at the end of chapter number uh, 1, look at verse number 30, having the same conflict which he saw in me and now here to be in me. They're having the exact same issues in their life. I promise you, if you will try to live for Jesus Christ, you're going to hit some difficulties in this life. You try to live, let me tell you some of you young people, you go to a school and you try to be a witness for Jesus Christ, you try to just live for Christ, I promise you, you'll have somebody that doesn't like it. So I don't, I don't like that situation. I don't like it for you either. But you can be content with Christ. You know why? Because the purpose that He told us is we are going to be in this life and it is going to be difficult at times. It is going to be difficult. In chapter 3, look, look what he says. In chapter 3, he starts talking about, in verse number 2, beware of dogs and evil workers and a concision. You're going to face some bad things in this life. And just because you face bad things, listen, doesn't mean you're going to quit on God. Just because you beat some bad people, doesn't mean you quit on God. Look at verse number 17 of chapter 3. Brethren, be followers together with me, and mark them which walk, so as ye have us for an example. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. We're going to run into people that are the enemies of Christ. Watch what it says. God will take care of this. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Watch verse number 20. This is the last little thing I'm trying to get you to get. Our conversation is in heaven. For whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. How many believe that Jesus is coming back one day? Verse 21, Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body, according to the work and whereby He is able even to subdue all things unto Himself. You know what He's... You know what he's here's how He can be content. He says, I trust that God saved me God 
can take care of the very end. God can take care of everything of my daily needs. And this is what I'm going to do. I'm just going to walk in God's purpose, understanding it's going to be difficult in this life. And yes, I'm going to run into some dogs. Yes, I'm going to run into some evil workers. Yes, I'm going to run the religious crowd. Yes, I'm going to work into some people, uh, walk into some people that are, are, are enemies of the cross of Christ. But this is not my home. I'm, I'm just a pilgrim passing through. I'm looking for the mansion over there on the hilltop. This is not where I'm going to be at forever. I'm going to be with Jesus Christ. Keep your focus on what is right. That's what you got to do. To be content, listen, in a nutshell, to be content, I have to stop trying to gather things and try to gather more of Him. To be content, I have to be satisfied that in His providence, that He knows what's going on and He will work things out in His time. To be satisfied, I'm going to have to get into His purpose and just keep on walking with Him, even though I'm going to see difficulties along the way. That's how I'll be content. And so that's what Paul did. <clears throat> when he says at the end here, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me, I think, it's a, I think it's a problem for someone to claim that verse if they're not actually walking with Christ. I think it's when we talk about being steady in God's purpose, Listen real close. It's hard for you, listen, it's hard for you to say, I can do all things while I'm doing things that I know Christ wouldn't approve of. I'm not even walking with Him. And I'm claiming, I know I can do it. How about just doing something with walking with Jesus Christ? When you get down to the verse, He says, My God shall supply all your need, verse number 19, according to His riches, in glory. It's hard for you to claim that verse and say, I have learned that to be true when you're not doing the things that are surrounding that verse. He says, God will supply your needs as you're taking care of others. See, we're claiming these verses and Paul said, I want you to, to bring it all the way back to the beginning. Paul said, I have learned. I know. I'm instructed. Church, let me ask you a question. How many of you have learned those verses? How many of you know them? How many of you will let them instruct you as you're going through the things of this life? See, if you know them and you've learned them and you're instructed by them, listen real close, I'm done. Here it is. You can do all things through Christ. But if you're not living out these truths, you say, are you trying to beat us up this morning? No, I'm trying to encourage you to begin to live out these truths. What is God's purpose? I want to walk in God's purpose for my life. God's taking care of His providence. I want to know more about Him, not possessions. I want more of Him. If we can get those types of things, I think you can actually have a content life. And you can start being thankful for what you do have instead of what you don't have. We live in a world where we're, 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 we're looking for things we don't have and we're upset about the things that we don't know instead of being content with what we do have and what we do know. How's your contentment going this morning? How are you doing? Have you learned these truths? And if you have, are you applying them to your life? Let's stand to our feet. <clears throat> She's going to come get us a song, give you a chance to maybe spend some time in prayer this morning. Maybe if you're lost this morning, you never trusted Christ your Savior, this would be a good time to trust Christ and get saved. If you are saved, you say, well, I don't know that I'm really walking with God the way I should. I, I've been chasing things as, as opposed to chasing God. Maybe this morning you just find a place on an altar, maybe at your seat, and start talking to God about, I want to know you and fellowship with you. Lord, we ask you to please bless us this morning. Help us as we try to just lift you up, preach your word. I pray that you'd help us. I pray that you'd please help these people. Lord, if there's somebody that's lost, they'd get saved. Somebody that's saved, they would just get a closer relationship with you. Somebody that's discontent in this life and are looking to move from here or do that or, or, or change spouses or change all the things about their life because they just don't, they don't find a way to be content with you. Help them this morning. Help us this morning. Lord, do a work in our life. We love you. We just want you to have more of us. You've apprehended us. We want to be able to apprehend you and press towards that mark. Bless in the lives of these people in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're just going to play, give you a chance to pray this morning.